my name is Tom Mason. I'm executive director of the US Japan Bridging Foundation. And I'm so excited today to welcome our moderator and panelists to today's event. The Bridging Foundation is a nonprofit organization that provides scholarships for undergraduates to study abroad. And we also provide mentorship and networking for those who want to create a lifelong connection with Japan. So if you're an undergraduate and hoping to study abroad, please do go to our website at bridgingfoundation.org. If you have already graduated, and if you're perhaps a community member, welcome to the Bridging Foundation. And we look forward to engaging with you over the next many months and years to support the undergraduates in their journey. I'd like to turn this over now to Amy DeLuise, who will be moderating today's event. Amy, I'm so excited for tonight. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Tom. Great to see you across the, the miles and everybody joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Um, I'm Amy DeLuise. I'm a digital storyteller. I'm your host for this evening. And um, I do want to do a shout out before we start to our sponsor, uh, Indeed and Recruit Holdings. So let me just tell you a little bit about them. Indeed is the number one job site in the world with over 250 million unique visitors every month. Wow, that is quite a lot. Their mission is to help people get jobs. And here's a little interesting tidbit. They were originally founded in 2004 in the United States in Austin, Texas and Stanford, Connecticut. But in 2012, were acquired by Recruit Holdings, which is a Japanese public company. Um, and now they're one of the leading Recruit Holdings uh, you know, businesses um, with more than $100 billion in market capitalization. And so that is a fantastic example of bridging between the United States and Japan. So um, that's a fabulous business connection. And we're actually our next webinar is going to be about business. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let me just tell you a couple cool features of Indeed. Um, first of all, um, you can see this job search page. And if you put the word Japan in the what box, um, you can find Japan related jobs. Another thing you could do is you could actually go to the Japanese site. So practice your, your language skills and look it up on the Japanese site. So think about that if you're considering a job in Japan. And I think a lot of people in this audience are definitely interested in that. And the other thing you might want to do is go to the resume builder. They've got a fabulous little resume building tool. So if you feel like yours needs a little bit of polishing, you can upload what you have and, um, and tweak that and make it a little bit better. Um, you can also do a job alert with keywords. So I've already told one of my um, one of my kids who's looking for a job to, to do that. So you can put keywords in and that's really important, especially using the word Japan might be one of your keywords or maybe translator might be one of your keywords. Um, so think about that. And then finally, there's a career advice page. Um, and so that's really helpful. There's a lot of great articles on there. Maybe you just need a little motivation or just some ideas. Um, so they've got some really great content. So Indeed is a really great tool to help you. And we are so grateful to them um, for bringing this webinar to you. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our, uh, our panel today. And thank you again, Tom, for introducing the whole shebang. Um, so let's introduce Allison, Mark and Powell and Ajani Aloye. So just wave. Um, so one thing I would like to do is tell you just a little bit about each of them, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time doing that because they're going to really talk to you about what they do during the course of this. So Allison is a translator, an editor, a publishing consultant. She has a very long resume. I'll only give you a few highlights. She has been awarded grants from English Pen and the NEA, um, and she won the 2020 Pen America Translation Prize for the 10 Loves of Nishino by Hiromi Kawakami. And she has translated many other works. Um, she also is part of the collective Strong Women Soft Power, which I think is fantastic. She's curating JFNY's online literary series. She was the guest editor for the first Japan issue of Words Without Borders. She has served as the co-chair of the Pen America Translation Committee and represents the Committee on Pen America's Board of Trustees. Um, so she has many, many jobs and titles. Um, so thank you, Allison, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And Ajani Aloye is a translator and manga editor. 
He does translation, technical writing, editing, and proofreading of Japanese language materials across a wide range of fields. One thing that's really cool about Ajani is that he has a background in UX design. So he really looks at that user interface and that intersection between language and user interface. So a lot of what he works on is user facing content on both external websites and internal uh, websites for uh, companies, whether it's in consumer electronics, tourism or entertainment. So he's gonna tell us a little bit more about that. So welcome, welcome to both of you. Thanks Ajani for joining us. Pleasure to be here. So I'm just gonna start uh, with you, Ajani, and just say, is there a project you're working on right now that you wanna just give us a little insight into and what, what excites you about that project? Um, actually, actually, I'm sort of taking a little little break right now uh, to kind of go for my, I have a lot on my plate with my full-time job and things, but uh, um, I a did- recent, You could say a recent project then. Yeah, um, a re recent. Well, I, there's something that's coming up actually. Okay. I can't, I can't divulge all the details and, and right. things, but it's a project that I, when I first started in this industry, uh, and part of like what I do um, as an editor is I might pitch uh, titles to be translated um, or brought into the American market, and it was something that it was like one of the first things I pitched that got swiftly rejected. Uh, but after all these years, uh, someone, I guess, is smiling upon me, or whatever, and uh, decided to license it. So um, that'll be something that'll come in fall uh, 2022, and I should be working on it in the coming months. And I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I guess the most I can say is probably it's, it's a sci fi uh, project from a, an artist that hasn't been published too much in the States. Um, and you know, it's the kind of thing that I really, really. I'm the type of sci-fi that I'm really into. So um, very much looking forward to that. It's always great to work on a project where the content itself is really exciting to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how about you, um, Allison? Is there something you're currently working on or looking forward to working on that um, you could fill us in a little bit about and what is exciting about it? Yes, I'm happy to, but I also love, I love hearing that, you know, these stories about, you know, projects that, you know, you have faith, you know, you just kind of stick with it. That's something, you know, it's one of those things when you have a passion project, you know, if you believe in it, you just, it's a matter, it's like lightning in a bottle, you know, so many things need to fall into place mm -hmm. for, you know, for something to happen, for a project to come together, for, you know, a, a, a property basically to mm -hmm. reach readers or audiences. So mm -hmm. um, that's exciting. I look forward to hearing about it. But for me, this is a, another, also a years long project. I have visual aids. This is my, <laughs> this is volume one of a book that I have been co-translating for years. It's called Lady Joker and it's by, uh, the author's name is Kaoru Takamura. Um, it's, um, well, the paperback in Japanese is about 1500, 1500 pages. Ooh, so, okay. Massive, yeah, it's a massive book. Volume one came out this year and volume two is coming out next year. So I've, yeah. we've just finished our, we're in the editing process of volume two and it's, wow. it's, it's a really exciting book. It came out in 1997 in Japan. It's a, um, it's based on an unsolved true crime. It's inspired by an unsolved oh. true crime that took place in Japan in the 80s, the Glico Morinaga case, which some of you may be familiar with. And um, this is, has been made into a film and a TV series in Japan. It's taught in schools in Japan and it's never been translated into English. So um, it's been a really intense project. A lot of research has gone into it, but, uh, wow. and it's also my first co-translation. I'm working with a woman named Marie Ida, and that's been uh, really gratifying to, uh, to bring this uh, to English speaking readers. That's exciting. And we've got a link in the chat. So if anybody wants to, to grab that book for their holiday giving season, the gift that we'll keep on giving for 1500 pages. <laughs> um, one question that, that that sort of raises with me, Allison, is, you know, I think of a translator pro job as being a very much of a solo job, but it sounds like sometimes you might do it in partnership, obviously with the author potentially, but in this case, another translator. How does that, how did that work on this particular project? Well, you know, I think, as I said, this is my first time co-translating. So we came up with um, a system that worked for us. Um, and this was a case of um, 
the editor came to me with the book when she had acquired the book and I just knew that it was a little too much for any one one translator to take on so yeah it just seemed like um a um, a natural to to team up with someone and Marie has been you know like the dream co-translator um but I'm actually just um I'm just, I just signed a contract to do another co-translation. This is a novella, much shorter book that we're, I'm going to be working on next year. And, and that's going to be a completely different uh, format. I mean, mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, when I first started working as a translator, I was, you know, a lot of translators, they, they were, we work in solitude. You right. know, we, we do our own thing. I worked from home or I worked in the library or I worked in a cafe or, you know, I don't work well in cafes, but you can work anywhere you are. But uh, a few years ago, I started meeting other, you know, I found a community of translators, a community of not as many, it's harder to find Jap in New York. There are not a lot of Japanese translators, Japanese literary translators, I should say, but um, I found a community of translators and that kind of changed everything for me and changed the way that I look at the profession. Interesting. So we have a question right off the bat, and I want to ask both of you this question. Um, Would you be able to go through your translation process? Now, you're probably going to have to truncate that a little bit because, you know, we only have an hour and we have a lot of other questions to get to. But could you just maybe talk, uh, maybe not exactly every piece of the workflow, but your philosophy as well as kind of how you break down a project? Start with you, Allison, then we'll go to to you, Ajani. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it starts with it starts with the first reading of the book. Um, you know, and we're we're talking about Japanese. So the first time I read a, the, the book in the original Japanese, uh, it has to. I mean, we're talking about literary translation. So I, I translate all kinds of books, and I, I do work on contract. So I translate things that I'm not, you know, that I didn't find myself or that I might not be passionate about. But I do need to feel like I can hear it. I can hear the voice in my head, mm-hmm. how I'm going to make it sound in English. Mm-hmm. So, and there have been authors that I have, you know, read and, you know, I'm not sure about, and I try and do a sample translation and it, it just, our styles don't work together. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's important to be able to identify that, um, you know, if you're, especially with literary translation, because you want to do justice to the work, you want to um, create um, a similar style in right in English. Um, So that's the first stage. And then, um, you know, I mean, I do, I read slowly. So I do a pretty close reading the first time and I work slowly. So I do a pretty clean draft. I mean, there is, I do edit obviously, but um, I don't, you know, every, some people do like a really fast pass through and then they edit and they revise and they revise and they revise. And I, I, I have a hard time. I kind of have to decide how this one sentence is going to be because I know that however I've translated the words as they appear here, then I'm going to want to use the same, you know, a similar structure, a similar style. So um, that's the way that I work. I mean, I did once, I once heard a translator describe um, the beginning is always the hardest part. And so like, no matter what length of book your, or project you're working on, like the first 10%, you're going to have to go back over, you know, that's right. how long it takes right. really right. to find a rhythm. Right, right. And that's, I think, true of writing as well. The beginning is always the hard part, the blank page, the, the flashing cursor. I know just from having written two books myself, which were nonfiction books, but still incredibly hard to get started. Um, so, Ajani, how about you? What is your process like? Because you're working on some nonfiction content, right? Mm-hmm. As well as some manga content. So what, you know, what is your translation process like? Uh, they're, they're both very similar for uh, nonfiction and for the manga content. Uh, the first s- step is always to kind of understand what I'm translating. Um, and just like Allison, you know, it's like reading through the material that I get. If it's like a brochure or a website, I try to kind of absorb everything that I can so that I could start kind of building uh, strategies of sorts uh, for how I want to approach uh, certain elements of it. Um, For manga, it's, it can be, I guess it could be a little more involved because uh, I might, uh, if I am starting a new series, that uh, takes a lot of work to kind of figure out like where something might be going. You know, the author might put something in there that doesn't like be, that's not revealed too much later. So I have to try to get as far on the series as I can in some cases um, when that's an option. 
you know, I'll just look at the, uh, read the volume through as thoroughly as I can. And then um, once I've gotten all the information that I can about it, I will, uh, I, I'm, I do, what works for me is I actually try to go through it quickly on the first pass. Uh, because there are usually for me, especially uh, in the COVID era, or whatever, there's got a lot of distractions being at home. I'm not in an office um, like I used to before. And I, uh, right. you know, my daughter might be home or something. And so um, it's best for me to kind of go through it very quickly and just kind of like get words on the page and okay. then kind of come back and start editing. I might do that in chapters, I might go through a whole book and come back depending on how. Um, difficult or um, dense the book is mm -hmm. uh, and then I do several revisions usually uh, one or two more passes of like an editing pass so interesting now we have a question that I think is a great one which is have you translated English books into Japanese so I'll start with you Allison no I don't um, I only translate only go the one direction I, I think most mm -hmm. translators only work into one language. There are some people who are comfortable based on their um, experience and um, upbringing. Um, but mm -hmm. I mean, we're not gonna start talking about what is native language, but um, right. just for the sake of using that phrase, native language, one typically translates into your native language. Got it. And same for you, Ajani? Uh, yeah, uh, basically I, I don't translate into Japanese, but I have, uh the the most i've done is uh if someone says like here's a list of words or something and i'll i can might be able to do that and but even those i turned down but in the past i have done that like uh you know these technical terms mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. using japanese and I'll, if i know the area uh, okay i'll do that and then um just like a, a small thing i did when i was a teacher in japan as an alt um i translated I mean, I guess I wrote the original content in English. I, I was I was in charge of a new, the school newspaper, and so I would write in English and then translate into Japanese. So cool. that's kind of the extent. So is that what got you started? I'm curious what got you into translating, Ajani. Oh, uh, I mean, I got into it. That was before I got into it before that. Um, I studied Asian studies um, at Florida State University, and before that, I had taken Japanese. And you know, I'd done you know translation exercise and those kind of things, but it really uh, started with me being in New York and kind of looking for a way to you know earn some money with the skills that I had. And I I went onto Craigslist, put my resume out, and was seeing if anyone would be interested in, in my services. And uh, the first job I did was for um, a local uh, karate dojo. Uh, translating their website and uh, from there you know, and at the same time I think I had uh, applied to Tokyo Pop a no longer uh, uh, it's a manga company that's no longer in business um, and passed their tests and started translating and uh -huh. so it was happening at the same time started my translation career. And how about you Allison what got you started? <laughs> Well, it wasn't my first gig, but I too got a gig on off of Craigslist as well. So <laughs> back in the day, that was that was a place to find work uh, in translation. Um, but well, so I I uh, I was always interested in literary translation, um, basically since high school French class, and um, and so when I went to uh, I went to college is when I started. Stud my you know freshman year is when I started studying Japanese. It was the first time it was available to me, and uh, I studied complet or I majored in complet. I studied French and Japanese literature, and uh, then started working for a commercial translation company in New York City, um, just to kind of see how that worked. I was an account manager, so I wasn't doing translation, but I was doing in-house editing and and putting the projects together, working with translators, so to sort of understand what. Uh, what practical translation involved and then um, but knowing that I wanted to be in literary and you know publishing translation so then I went um, I went back for a master's degree in Japanese literature because four years studying Japanese as an undergrad didn't really get to read a lot of Japanese mm -hmm. in or a lot of literature in Japanese so um, and I at the same time I also um, before doing my my master's I went 
back to Japan at to the Inter-University Center, to the IUC Center, which some of you may know, um, may be alums from. Um, and so I did a, you know, another um, sort of intensive study to, in order to do my, uh, my master's, to, to feel, com you know, confident enough to do my master's degree. And then that's when I started working in publishing. Like I got a job at a tiny publisher. I was at Stanford for my master's and I found there was this tiny publisher. It's like a health publisher, but um, you know, I needed to know how the industry worked. So I got a job at a publisher in Mountain View, California. And then I got an internship at Kodansha America before it um, folded. And it was actually when I showed up, I interviewed for the internship and was offered the internship. And when I showed up to work, they had decided to fold the company. So that was disappointing, but they were still putting out books. So, um, and I, you know, formed some long-term relationships there. And I saw how Kodansha America, what they were doing too. I mean, they published, they published dreams for my of my father. They published Barack Obama's book in paperback. So um, it's a, uh, pretty amazing. Anyway, um, so I spent a few years working in, in publishing in the editorial department. I worked for a literary agent just so that I could understand who mm. was making these decisions. Mm. Who is deciding which books are going to be translated? Who is hiring the translators? What are they basing these decisions on? What are the criteria? And um, who, you know, I wanted to kind of get to know these people so that maybe they would hire me. Um, so I started, um, I, the first gig that I ever got at, not the Craigslist gig, but um, the first gig that I got was a manga series. I was um, with Viz Media, actually got in on a new shonen manga that they were starting to publish. And I did the first 12 volumes, which was a really great gig for a freelance translator. Um, I mean, it wasn't the first thing I had tried to do, but it was the first thing that I got paid to do. So it was a great experience. Which is always your memorable contract. Yeah, exactly. in my, the first dollar bill. So um, I'm curious, um, what, for both of you, uh, is there something you think is unique to translation out of Japanese um, that might not be the same as translate. I mean, I guess it's not a fair question because you're not necessarily translating from other languages, but knowing what you know with other other translators, is there something unique about that? Johnny, do you think there's anything? Um, maybe one thing is the kind of visibility of Japanese translation these days. Um, at least in manga, it's people are more aware of like, uh, the translation and mm -hmm. that can that can have its um good and bad points mm -hmm. i think and so that that's one of the things you have to be kind of conscious of the audience in a different way maybe right what another um types of translation i'm going to come back to you allison on that question but just following up with you ajani i'm curious somebody wanted to know um if there's anything particularly difficult about translating manga and do you translate sound effects or do you leave them in Japanese? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, well, first, uh, the easy one is the sound effects one. And that depends on the publisher. And so it's different publishers will have different approaches. Uh, like Viz Media, they mostly uh, translate the sound effects and the art, they retouch the art out. But uh, for their uh, simul pub, uh, you know, the type of things that they post at the same time as they do in Japan um, that are online. Uh, through their app and things, they will subtitle them. And then other companies like Kodansha Comics, uh, most of the Kodansha um, related ones, you know, will subtitle. Um, Yen Press is another one, and they have like a different approach where they have like two subtitles for the sound effects, like a mm -hmm. translation and the actual sound. Right. At the same time. Interesting. So it just really depends on the, the publisher. Um, but for manga, uh, I mean, it has it has its challenges, but it also has things that can make it a little easier. One of the things that can make it easier is that you have visuals to go mm -hmm. from. Right. So a lot of times, um, something may be a little opaque if it was just the written word on the page, but you have something there to kind of show you, give you a clue as to what's, especially with sound effects, that can be a big thing where a sound effect, um, if you don't have enough context there, could be any many different things. But now that you have it right next to 
um, you know, like a flashing light or something like that. Okay, well, I know it should be this, this sound, it's a flashing light, or maybe it's the, the sound of electronics making that thing flash or mm -hmm. like that. Got so um, that's one thing that can make it easier. But as far as challenges, mm, I mean, sometimes because of, the, for on the other flip side of that, because you're relying on the visuals it can also maybe sometimes authors can make it purposely vague and uh that can be a, a challenge right uh, but off the top of my head that's 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 what i what i can think of allison do you think there's anything unique to japanese translation or sure i mean like ajani was talking about the the vagueness um i think um one of the things that i have found with prose because that's basically what i what i translate now is prose and it's um a lot of with japanese a lot of what's on the page is what it's what isn't said and so um that can be difficult to convey because you can be much more ambiguous in japanese and english kind of demands precision or it makes you have to make decisions um whereas in japanese you can kind of leave things you know um in the air and um i mean i think with any language you're translating culture but the culture is so embedded in the language you know in the in the language and the words but also in the, the structure and the syntax mm. and so that that can be really challenging right to get it How how have things changed since you've been doing you've been doing this for a while Allison so is has there been an evolution um in terms of the audience what they're expecting what you do differently maybe now than you did before yeah I think I'm not saying that I mean I feel like it's not to say that readers have become more sophisticated that they weren't sophisticated before but um I think editors are more willing to trust, to put trust in the readers. And, and I myself feel like um, I, I'm able to um, put more faith mm -hmm. that, I mean, especially now that we have Google, if you want to know something, you know, like you right. just you can look it up, you know, whereas, you know, mm -hmm. decades ago, it would have required more research. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, translators used footnotes and endnotes and things like that, which I think really get in the way of, um, reading the experience of reading a novel but right. um yeah i mean i am much less likely to um translate certain japanese words you know i'm it's like foods or certain cultural um phenomena mm -hmm. i'm more likely to leave it in japanese and i'm more likely not to italicize it yeah interesting and, yeah so here's a follow-up. Well, it may be sort of somewhat related question. Somebody asked, how do you tackle Yakuarigo when translating to English, convey the nuances that Yakuarigo express in Japanese? That's a good one. I, I actually have a, a Is that book. a good is that one for you? Oh, Johnny. <laughs> I think I got a whole a whole dictionary for that. For <laughs> there you go. Amazing. Wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially it shows up in in comics a lot because you know, especially for the characters and kind of uh, showing who they are as a person and what kind of uh, you know character they are and those kind of things, um, it comes up a lot. And you have to work around it because you can't just have like Gobi or like an ending or something there to just say like, oh, well, this is this uh, specific archetype or whatever mm -hmm. here. Um, and you, you try to find equivalents where you can in mm -hmm. American or Western uh, characters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, you have the gangster type, you might do something to make them seem kind of like more rough and tumble um, in, in English. Uh, there's lots of ways around it, but it, it's not usually an easy thing to do. Uh, you can't just add something on there. Uh, or like uh, maybe a good example too is like some some of the comes up with puns or with like cat characters and things too. And I've seen people, you know, instead of having like the nyan and those kind of things in there, we just put in a whole bunch of cat puns to kind of get across. Somebody the... wants that that book title that you just held up. Oh oh yeah sure. We're gonna hold uh, it up yeah, again. Yeah, it's the uh, Yakuari ga kochita. <laughs> there you go. Amazing. 
Um, like getting dictionaries, like weird dictionaries. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for asking again, Jacob. So um, we have several people in the audience who are saying that, you know, they want to become a translator. Um, someone says it's my passion and my dream, but I'm afraid I might not be able to make a career out of it. Is becoming a full-time translator a realistic goal? And, and I think you both have very different perspectives on that. Allison, it sounds like you're doing this full-time. Ajani, you have another job. So give us your perspectives on that. Allison, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it well, being a full-time freelance literary translator is not the most um, lucrative career decision to make. Um, if you work a lot you can sort of, I mean, you have to, you know, it, it, working any job freelance, you know, it's hard to sort of, you know, you never know what things are coming in, you know, you kind of have to say, you feel like Feast you have to say and yes. famine, as exactly. they say. Exactly. <laughs> you have to really know how to allocate your own time to those yeah. projects. And you have to, I think, I mean, I did not start out full time. You know, when I, when I started translating, I still had um, part-time jobs mm -hmm. and, uh, it's in that sense, it was good to sort of help me divide my time, but it also, um, you know, it, it, it takes a while as a translator, it takes a while to develop your network because right. that's really what it's about because right. these people need to be calling you to give you right. the work, to give you the jobs. And so um, I think you kind of have to build that into your plan. Right. And good point. yeah, and it's sort of depending whatever, field you're going into, whether it's going to be um, manga or light novels or literary, you know, novel or, you know, literary fiction or nonfiction or, you know, patents, you know, you're going to need um, to kind of figure out who, who the players are. Right. Like I said, like the same, you know, who are the people who are making the decisions to, hi to, to hire whomever? So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's my answer. What about you, Johnny? You're doing sort of more than one career on dual track. Yeah, uh, wait, sorry, is my connection okay? I was, I was getting yeah. Okay, cool. Just for um, a second, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I also did the freelance full-time for a while. I did uh, two different uh, stints of that. And um, like Allison, you know, take, you have to ramp up to it and you have to develop those networks. And um, I did a lot of agency work. So it was like getting off an agency, um, earning their trust mm -hmm. and kind of finding a niche so that you're always the person they can go to for you know certain topics and and things and um, that eventually can be sustainable but it really is a thing of you you reach a point where you have to uh, just do more work to get more money or you have to you know raise your prices to make it more sustainable for you and that can be a challenge mm -hmm. um, and being after you know, my last full-time job, I was in publishing, I was a full-time editor, um, but publishing is, uh, you know, doesn't, the honest truth, it doesn't pay very well. Um, and many, I mean, maybe there, there are ways that it can, but um, for manga publishing, uh, speaking from my experience, it, it's hard to kind of like, to, you, you reach a ceiling pretty quickly. Right, right. Uh, and so I, it became for me uh, at a certain point, a choice of, do I wanna continue uh, doing this full time or do I want to take care of my family? Right. <laughs> and, I think, and I had to choose to take care of my family and uh, figure things out uh, that way. So uh, now I have a full-time job in UX uh, writing and I do translation and editing on, on the side and I'm able to mm -hmm. uh, maintain that way. I, I still think it's possible to have a well-paying job uh, with influence translation full-time or within publishing, but it takes more work. Mm -hmm. I have to get to a different position. I have right. to maybe start my own mm -hmm. uh, business. And then that would be, you know, probably in the, the, in the negative in the beginning and kind of like I have to ramp up there too. Right. Uh, it just takes a lot of work, so. Well, you, you've brought up something about, um, for the life of a freelancer, which I'm very familiar with, having been one my entire career. Um, and really, the only way you can solve that income issue when you charge for your time is passive income. So the question that I have is a follow-up is, what about royalties? Do translators get royalties 
Um, I'm going to throw this one to you, Allison, because I think you've been pretty passionate about advocating for translators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, as far as I know, I mean, and Johnny can correct me, but I'm pretty sure that translators never get royalties for manga. Mm -hmm. They don't even usually get copyright. So um, right. do they for other works? Um, well, yes, but not always. And so that that was what a lot of the work when I was came when I became involved with the translation committee at PEN America, we do a lot of advocacy there. And um, one of the jobs that I had in publishing, I worked at a literary agency and I vetted contracts. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to read publishing contracts. And that's one of the things that is, you know, I, I hear from freelance translators, they're, it's not that they're terrified of them, they just don't know what, what their rights are. Right. So uh, I have done a lot of advocacy to help people just recognize like, you know, you have to prioritize, you know, what are the things that are most important to you? Is copyright, is royalties important? Do you want your name on the cover? Mm -hmm. You know, all of these things right. um, are factors. They're all negotiable. Um, exactly, they're all negotiating you, points. And, right. and as you start your career, you probably have a little less leverage. So maybe you have to take one and not the other. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then you start setting precedents. And I mean, there's a big movement within the literary translation commu community right now for names on covers. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, like you said, passive income is important. And I mean, earning royalties, even if they're small royalties on, you know, some of these books will stay in print. Right. And, right. you know, if you're getting a royalty, you know, that, right. It's not a, it's not the, you know, strongest pension, but it's something no, that you, but it's, it it's something uh, pays for more groceries than a name on a cover does. So yeah, exactly. you have to make a trade off, but that's a tough one. That's a tough one in many ways. So you oh, mentioned wait, actually, contracts. Um, oh, go ahead, uh, Johnny. No, I wanted to say, I, I remember there actually, I do remember a company that did give real royalties for, for manga translation. I'm not mm -hmm. sure they do it anymore, but I believe at one point J novel um or not manga i guess for light novel translation mm -hmm. uh, they had some kind of payment scheme where i guess if you took like a lower rate or did something like that they could give you royalties uh for mm -hmm. for that series or that something like that but mm -hmm. i'm not sure they're still doing that so it, it does happen but it's very very rare and right, be right. And then well, one more you have to do that equation right to try to calculate for yourself you know which is the better thing to take money now cash now versus cash who knows when mm -hmm. and i also wanted to say that it is very important to understand contracts uh for any type of translation and i i i, I totally see that um with newer translators i just don't understand what is even possible um because there are a lot of unfortunately uh companies who take advantage of that um and will put in uh things like you know non-disclosures and uh things like that that might technically be legal in some cases but um mm -hmm. people don't know the better so they sign it and you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. it that way so yeah always have an attorney look at things for you Somebody asked, how do you land a contract? I think that's like a whole other webinar. So I'm not sure we can go into <laughs> that, entire, that entire aspect of sort of that tipping point between marketing and making a sale. But I think some of this is in your world, Allison, just in terms of like networking and sort of how you kind of build a network and build a name for yourself. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I mean, <clears throat> It was, I mean, I, I, I went, I felt like I was, you know, like hacking out a path myself, you know, I think it's a little, it's actually a little, I'm not going to say it's easier now, but it's a little clearer how one might go about becoming um, a person who translates books, mm -hmm. um, because especially books from Japanese, because when I started there were, when, when I was wanted to get started it really was still a lot of um Japanese professors a lot of white male Japanese professors mm -hmm. were the ones doing the translations and um I knew that I didn't want to be in academia so I went you know that's why I went through the publishing route and also um anyway so um in terms of just um I, you know, passion does get you, it gets you a certain, you know, 
part of the way there. But then, you know, it really is just like doing your research, learning who publishes what. And people are much more accessible now, especially with social media. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see who's behind different books mm -hmm. nowadays. So, um, you know, if there's a book that you really admire, really enjoy, you know, find out, you know, look at the publisher, you know, you can, sometimes you can look at the ad acknowledgements or you can Google it and figure out, you know, who is the editor. And then right. Right. you can reach out to them and say, you know, Hey, I'm a Japanese translator, you know, I'm, or, I, you know, if you want reader reports, reader reports is a good way to kind of get in. I, 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 I mean, some people enjoy reader reports perhaps more than I do, um, but reader reports is a good way to um, familiarize yourself with books that you may not have had the chance to read yet. And, um, you know, publishers at times will commission uh, someone to read a book in Japanese and, you know, write a report on, you know, whether like the viability of it in the English language market. So you kind of have to learn how that get, gets written. Um, mm -hmm. And that does, that usually pays pretty little. It's maybe a couple hundred bucks, but you know you're getting paid to read. You still have to right. write something, but um, but you know time wise, it doesn't usually work out very well. Um, but that's a great way to kind of start letting people know that you're there and that right. you want Get to get your foot in the door. I mean, I would caution against doing any or too much work on spec. Yes. doing things doing unpaid labor because yeah. it sets up a bad uh bad precedent for everybody exactly yeah uh, johnny anything you want to add to landing a contract uh i mean similar similar thing maybe like networking is a great way to kind of like be known there's always a need for uh new people to do uh there's so much work coming in especially now that things are doing better for manga um that there's always a need for more people but uh it does sometimes because it's, it's also kind of like a small industry you know the manga industry um you sometimes see the same names over and over again uh and that's sometimes because people just don't know anyone else uh, and you have you kind of get in someone's ear and then uh you might come up and there are different ways to do that uh like austin was saying that the people behind the books are more visible these days so you can always like look and see who's like doing this who's the publisher who's the translator and um, editor and those kind of things um you can also you know for manga there's also the uh conventions and right. that's right early on when i when i was uh getting into translation i would go to you know places and have people pull my card and you know maybe i think i did get Actually, I think that's how I started with the Tokyo Pop one. I took the test, but I went to a convention and I actually gave someone my card and said, I'm interested in this. Um, so that, that, that definitely helps too. Has there been an advantage to you at all or disadvantage to you being an African-American? I mean, especially because manga is popular with a certain, there's a lot of African-American readers for manga. So I don't, does that, has that benefited you or is there any I'm, I'm still not minus. totally sure if it's benefited me. Um, it's, <laughs> is it, it's, it's, a, it's still a, a challenge. Are there still a lot of white yeah. male translators? <gasps> it's still it's still a challenge. I mean, I think um, I think a good thing is that I haven't really if, among translators, I haven't really had many issues with like you know who I am and my background. Uh, you know, affecting that or people attacking me for anything like that. Um, it has helped, I think sometimes, and that there's a, for any kind of minority, or maybe there's a certain experience um, and background that I have that can kind of tune into a different wavelength of like how I can approach translation sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm not stuck in one one way. And I'm looking mm -hmm. at, um, I'm looking at another culture as someone who is in other, in other culture in America. And I think that has uh, some influence there. So that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, in the industry itself, it was something that when I first started, my answer was very different. And I think I didn't really want to consider, you know, that I'm different. Uh, you know, it's America, the, the free and everyone's like, no, no, you know, people are nice, you know, color, everyone's colorblind, that kind of thing. But uh, unfortunately, being in the publishing industry, um, before I, I left my last job, I had a few different incidents, not again with publishing 
where I was kind of made aware of my my blackness, I guess. Um, and that wasn't great and made me want to be more involved in making things more equitable. Uh, and particularly in an industry that relies so much on um, you know, money and um, appreciation from black customers, I think that could be more done. And it is unfortunate that, you know, there's mostly there's diversity that's happening. Uh, more people are coming in, uh, more people of color who are speaking Japanese and kind of like getting their foot in the door and working on things, um, but not enough opportunities to kind of like get anywhere that can have more of an impact. Uh, a lot of the people who are uh, at a management or above level are mm -hmm. are usually white men. Uh, unfortunately, and uh, it would be nice to see a little more uh, diversity there mm -hmm. uh, in different ways. It doesn't even have to be about skin color, but it's, it's, there definitely is like a type of person that ends up in those positions. So, mm. Allison, anything you want to say on the gender side of this equation? Well, I mean, to the same point, I think um, one of the one of the things that I've been working on with um, Penn as well is that. Uh, we are updating a manifesto on translation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, one of the main points of that, I mean, there's a whole section on racism in US based literary translation, but, um, and another section on gender in the production of US based uh, literary translation, but it, it's about translation must be sustainable as a livelihood. I mean, part of the problem in publishing has always been that it's not um, it's not sustainable. You know, it's a self-selecting uh, group because the pay has been so low, and they have started raising entry-level salaries. Um, I can't really say that much about you know advancement and, and when you hit the ceiling, and um, because I I got out before I had to answer those questions. But um, but as far as translation, you know, it rates. Um, rates i mean you can negotiate better rates and it's just that's what's important is that we need to if we want a diverse body of literary translators we need to pay rates that enable people who you know who aren't you know doing it as a um you know a side gig or some people who are doing it as a you know an avocation and so and and i think that when you when it pays better when it becomes more lucrative then it becomes more attractive. It's, it's uh, you know, it becomes, um, it looks like a viable option to a broader right. group of people. Right, interesting. Well, we have several questions about how much studying of Japanese you needed to do before you A, felt capable of translating or before other people thought you would be capable of translating. So I'm curious, how many years of Japanese did you study or, you know, how did you prepare yourself? I want to start with you, Allison. And are you still studying Japanese? That's another question that we have from our audience. You know, I would say, yes, I'm still studying. I mean, reading and, you know, engaging with it on a regular basis. I mean, altogether, I have lived in Japan a very short period of time um, with my, study, you know, studying there. I've, you know, gone there regularly, but that's been sort of the, the, biggest um, handicap, I guess I would say. I've been studying, you know, I studied it, you know, four years as an undergrad. I spent another year in Japan studying it intensively. And then I did a two-year master's program. So like my formal study was, you know, that many number of years, but um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I've been engaging with the language and the culture and the literature for decades now. And I feel like, um, yeah, there's, there's, you know, there are always things to learn, but I also think for translation, just do it. I don't think that there's a point where you, you know, you're now you're ready. Mm -hmm. I think if you are interested, if you're curious about it, just try it, you mm -hmm. know, at any point. And do you think you have to live in Japan? Someone wants to know in order to understand the nuances. It's not to understand the nuances, but it's such it's such a challenging language, and it's so much different. It's such a challenging language for a native English speaker, I should say, that um, and it's so much different. Any any language is different. It's you know it's more alive when you're right immersed in it. 
Well, we have so many questions and only a few more minutes. So I want to get to as many as I can. Um, so one question is, um, let's see. Oh, I had a really good one here and I've lost track of it. Hang on a second. Um, oh, someone wanted to know that even though you're both very experienced, is there something that still challenges you about translation? So I'll start with you, Ajani, and then go to you, Allison. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's a wide world out there as far as different types of topics, and there are different ones that are always going to be a challenging for, challenge for me. Um, I had a, a, an offer to work on um, a manga that deals with shogi, and I, I had to decline it because I did a sample, uh, it sounded like they liked it, but uh, they offered me the series, and I was like, I, I just don't know if I can <laughs> work with like shogi notation and and all the different moves and, and things and really like understand the game mm -hmm. I need to do that to be able to to do this uh so those kind of like deep technical mm -hmm. uh things for, for me can be a challenge and it's mm -hmm. I'm always wanting to learn more uh but I have my my limits Allison how about you something that continues to be a challenge I mean it's it's all a challenge you know <laughs> there's, there's all it's all a challenge really I mean it's, you know this like Lady Joker was a um an you know there was like I said there was so much research it was just like you know part of it took place at a at a racetrack so I had to learn how to I don't even know how I don't know the words if you don't know the words in English right. you know I don't know how to describe like you know what you how you bet on horses in English you know like a now I know like a trifecta and a, you know quinella and all of these things but right. but I didn't know that you know and I can you know I think we got it right but you know and I think it's also always important to ask people for mm -hmm. advice you know mm -hmm. ask people if they got it right look for experts you know mm -hmm. should a translator be kind of invisible to the reader or is there is it is there actually would I recognize Allison's style if I read enough of your translations compared to other translations? I mean, I, I hope that I'm always, I'm trying to convey the the author's style, but I think if you read my translations, you might get a sense of the books that I like. And so <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ajani? Do I think it might be unavoidable in, in a way to like you, you can try to erase yourself as a as a translator as much as you want but you know you might still have quirks that kind of like come out mm -hmm. and think and I think ideally that that's what I want to accomplish is to be invisible and just let the reader enjoy the author's uh you know sentiment and things without you know an extra layer there um but at the same time you know I've thought about this off and on and um it, it is important to have some visibility um, in some way because uh, like Allison was talking about before about uh, the sustainability of the industry and the job and that kind of thing and sometimes that erasure can make it easier for the business side of things to kind of uh, uh, devalue the work that a translator does mm -hmm. so when we get to a point where that value is like where it needs to be then more than yes uh it should kind of be that way but uh we need to have some something needs to, to work out a little better for before that can happen i think hmm. that makes me ask about um ai is there is there ai translating now that that is at a level that's acceptable is there any machine learning that can keep up um or is there always going to be a role for humans in this? What do you think, Ajani? Uh, I think that there will probably always be a role, especially for Japanese, uh, mm -hmm. for, for humans to, to do this, uh, especially for Japanese translation. Um, and, and manga, especially, it's hard to, you know, you have to, you have to involve like OCR and different kinds of things for that to work. Um, in more technical translation, where it really is just like you have a limited vocabulary that keeps being reused all the time and certain sentence structures that keep being reused and reused. Mm -hmm. um with ai uh and machine translation and things like that it is possible to save work there but it still isn't perfect i've worked with agencies that rely on a lot of machine translation mm -hmm. and um even when things sometimes we'll get like a really really good sentence but every other sentence has like some right. very strange thing like 
something's left out, like the computer's just like not understanding it. Yeah, I, I, have to, I have to lean with you on this one. I recently got a gift of a sweater and the washing instructions, which is like six words, were completely un understandable because they'd obviously been machine translated. <laughs> I was, I had no idea what it was supposed to mean. I don't know which language it came from originally, but it was not a success. And that was only seven words. Um, so I'm wondering about uh, other translators. Are there other translators you look up to? Uh, Jim wants to know, you know, who are the translators you respect or look up to? So I'll throw that to you, Allison, first. Yeah, lot, lots of them. Um, I would say Steven Snyder comes to mind. He's, um, he has done a lot of, he's worked with a lot of different authors, but he's most, well, best known for his work on Yoko Ogawa. And um, Juliet Winters Carpenter. Um, my probably my favorite book is Masks by Fumiko Enchi, which was translated by Juliet Winters Carpenter. And I've always admired um, the work she does. And and I look to see, you know, when she she does, you know, I if she has translated a new author that I'm not familiar with, I have um, I, it will make me curious about that author. How about you, Ajani? Um, just, I guess as an editor, there were translators that I just really liked working with, um, like Stephen Paul, who is the One Piece translator. Uh, he does a lot of, he did a lot of work for Karancha when I was there, and it was always um, such an easy edit uh, with his, his work. But um, most of the editors, I, most of the translators I worked with, what was great was uh, when they were very, um, you know, receptive to feedback. Mm -hmm. And it can really work together. It felt like a, a partnership instead of me just like you know dictating or kind of pointing things out. Um, so yeah, those you know those kind of translators were the best for me. Somebody wants to know about pitching, and somebody has a sort of related question about pitching a particular not novella that they've already translated. Do you ever go ahead and translate something and then approach? A publisher, an agent, about about publishing your translation, or do you? How how does a pitch happen? Is there such yeah. a thing, or do they come to you all the no, time? No, I mean, I think it, you know, publishers, editors are always. They all editors will say that they are looking for you know they're interested in more, other you know new Japanese books, um, but it you know it is again I sort of that lightning in the bottle that kismet you know figuring out what different editor sensibilities are mm -hmm. um, and whether or not it's going to fit with that publishing house. So I think mm -hmm. in terms of making a pitch, um, you know, figure out, you know, make a list of the publishers that you think where it might fit. And then you have to write a really great submission letter. And, um, you know, the, usually the best thing to do is to send like a query letter. I mean, the good thing about literary translation is that you don't necessarily need an agent. I mean, most publishers do not take unsolicited submissions for things that are originally written in English, but in translation, um, you you probably do have that advantage. And so, you know, if you can find a way to reach out to them, you can query them, tell them about it, give them a teaser, get them excited about it, and then offer the a sample or the full manuscript and Mm -hmm. It can mm -hmm. happen. As a, a follow-up related more to your to your workflow, Allison, someone wants to know what does your work week look like? How many hours? When and where do you work? Oh my God. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I'm gonna say <laughs> also feast or famine, right? You know, yeah, you know, I was you know, gonna say it's uh it's probably not what you think, Cody. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not the life you know. it's not pretty. <laughs> Yeah, but it means that if I want to take a yoga class on a Wednesday morning, I can do that and then right. I can work on Saturday. So, right, exactly. So, I think the answer, Cody, might just be she works as many hours as she needs to to deliver on the yeah. products, right? As a freelancer, you, you should always be working. So, yeah. And the other thing is that um, there's a sort of ebb and flow to work. I mean, there's sort of think time and that and reading time, right? And that's not the same as like going in and doing fine tuning editing time. So you may divide your time differently depending on like times of day when you're more generative, creative versus more like, okay, I can get through this 
sort of more logistical work. Is that accurate? Definitely, definitely. I mean, that's how my days flow anyway, but it is, uh, it's a lot of work to be a freelancer, Cody. So, you know, just be, uh, be brave. <laughs> um, we're really ready to wrap up because we're, we're actually out of time. I know there's a lot more questions, so um, we, can, we can save that chat. I think, Lara, um, maybe you can save it so that um, maybe those, some of those questions we might be able to follow up. Um, with our fabulous uh, guests, because I know there's just um, so many, so much interest here tonight. And it's just been such a fabulous conversation with both of you. So on behalf of US Japan Bridging Foundation and our sponsors at Indeed and Recruit Holdings, I wanna thank you, Allison, for joining us and Ajani for joining us and to all the wonderful people who are in the chat. Um, so actively, thank you so much to all of you. Um, why don't we put down a T in the chat, T for translators, put down a T for thank you um, and say thank you to our, uh, to our fabulous uh, speakers today. Thanks for joining us and to everyone in the audience too. Thank you for having us. Thanks for being here. And this is the upcoming uh, webinar. So don't forget um, similarities and differences in Japan and US business practices. That's gonna be on the 15th in the US in the evening on the 16th if you're in Japan time. So that is gonna be uh, a fabulous last uh, webinar of the season. So please join us for that in just a couple of weeks. And thank you again, everyone who has joined us tonight. See you next time. <laughs>